Okay. PowerPoint, only one slide. Pollock, a brain in a vat, or BIV, brain in vat. So Pollock tells a fictional story. It's a little bit of a mind blowing sci fi science fiction or philosophical fiction, fi fi, as I have coined the term fi fi. Uh, of course, if you read it, then you know what the story is about. I'm going to assume that you read it and that you know what the story is about. So if you haven't, go back and read it and then come back. Otherwise, you won't really know what I'm talking about. You know, the punchline is in the story is when the, uh, the main character is told that it's already happened to him. And then he kind of goes a little crazy trying to figure out how he could even figure that out, right? So even though it's a fictional story, you can imagine that someone just told you. Guess what? You're not in reality right now. You're in something like a virtual reality. You entered into an experience machine, or you're a simulated being, right? We've so well perfected the art of simulating mental states that we can digitize them, and a computer can have a program in it that perfectly well models an ordinary human being. It's allegedly conscious states could be wired to digital sense organs that feed it sensory images, visual perceptions, all that kind of stuff. You know, once we figure out how the brain does all that, we could replicate it and digitize it and create simulated beings. How do you know that hasn't happened to you, right? If you haven't seen the movie The Matrix, it's a sci-fi movie, which I mentioned on the uh, PowerPoint, then you really should see it because it's a very classical philosophical film, although it's action-packed adventure. Um, like the fiction that you just hopefully read, it raises this philosophical puzzle. How do you know that you're not a brain in a vat or that you're not a simulated being in The Matrix or something like that. So on the slide where I have science in the middle of the page, uh, the first bullet says recognition wave, 1980s. Um, I was a teenager, I guess, or maybe a little older than that, uh, whatever. At, at a younger point in my life during the 1980s, I remember reading science magazines. I used to like to read Omni and Discover and Science Digest and things like that, all the new science discoveries and inventions and technology. And I remember reading about, I was really interested in biofeedback, where they put the sensors on your scalp and monitor your brain waves because people could use biofeedback to teach themselves how to meditate and calm down, and speed up their learning process. And I'm into meditation. So it really caught my eye when I realized that they put on a lot more electrodes on, on people's heads and differentiated a lot more than just the four basic brainwave states that they had first discovered, waking state, where the, uh, when the needle, the brain's being monitored and the needle is going like this on a piece of white paper, spinning out like when you have a heart exam or something, or, each time that the needle goes up and down, that's a cycle per second. So 13 cycles per second or something like 11 to 13 when you're wide awake. That's how many, And that represents the amount of electrical activity in your brain, all your neurons firing electrochemical interactions in the trillions per millisecond or blink of an eye. And then like, as you're just about to fall asleep, you're in between, you're in a twilight kind of state where weird dreamlike images and 
irrational thoughts are kind of blending in your mind. If you become aware of it, you kind of snap out of it and wake up. But if you don't, you get groggy and you kind of fall into dream state. That in-between state, let's say that's something like 9 to 11 cycles per second. It's slowing down. And, and then when you fall into a dream state, uh, the needle is slower, something like uh, 7 to 9 right? cycles per second. Um, and when you're in the dream state, see my eyes, and I'm going to get close up there. Under my eyelids, my eyebrow, my eyeballs are rolling around in my head, right? That's called rapid eye movements. Because you're having dreams, dreams are visual images. It's as if you're seeing, so your eyes are moving around, even though your eyelids are closed. And whenever they wake someone up, when they have the... Um, brainwave pattern associated with the rapid eye movement and dreaming, they wake them up, and then they can tell you what their dreams were. Um, even people who thought that they haven't had a dream in years in the sleep labs, they would wake them up when they were having that pattern, and then they would go, oh yeah, I was dreaming. Um, so we all dream every night. We just don't remember it a lot. And then when you fall into dreamless sleep, the deepest, most calm, relaxing place, it's like four to six very slow waves, right? A very little brain activity, in other words. I guess whatever minimal activity is required to keep your heart pumping and stuff like that. Um, when they wake people up from dreamless sleep, they don't remember any dreams, even though they've monitored their brains and see that maybe every 30 minutes or so you cycle into dreaming and down into dreamless sleep. And I forget how long each period lasts, but it's an ongoing cycle. Dreamless, dreaming, dreamless, dreaming, that sort of thing, right? So um, that was the original knowledge about brainwave patterns. But in the 1980s, I remember reading in the science magazine that they had done a much more better job of monitoring differences in brainwave patterns with computers monitoring and analyzing these patterns and they identified hundreds of different brainwave patterns associated with different kinds of activities and perceptions and mental states and whatnot. Here's one freaky example. And they named them and numbered these brainwave patterns, but I only remember one, the one that frightened me the most. So they wire you up and they flash by maybe, you know, a hundred photographs before your eyes rapidly in one second. And the computer is monitoring your brain during that one second. And then they, well, let's say a thousand photographs in a 10 second period, so that there's a hundred per second, right? And, um, and then they ask you, well, there was a lot of quick photos that just went by. Did you recognize any faces? And you say, no, I didn't. But at 3.5 seconds into it, Photo 357 was a photograph of your grandmother or something like that. And this is your brainwave pattern up until 3.57. And when there's a big spike, let's just say, or some other indication that there's something unique only at that moment where there was a face that went by that you know. Your brain recognized it, but your conscious mind didn't. Now that scared me because of, you know, CIA interrogating you and you know get, getting information out of you against your will. You can't take the Fifth Amendment against that. Um, it's my own criminal mind, I guess. Um, but there was lots of different brainwave patterns like that. And that was, what, 30, 40, almost 40 years ago. I also remember um, they would take like a grid of test tubes and put rat neurons, rat brain cells, you know, one in each, and you know, each uh, neuron is like that, and it has all these fibers coming out of it, like wires that connect it with other neurons, some going in and some going out, or sending a signal out or taking a signal in, receptors and senders, right, axons and dendrites, and um, where each one of these wires, so to speak, meets a cell, there's an interaction that's a synapse or a, syn a synaptic interaction or event. So we have uh, hundreds of billions of brain cells and um, each one has something like between 50 and 200,000 wires connecting it with other brain cells. 
So we'd have roughly, I don't know, something in the teens, maybe something like 17 trillion synaptic interactions per blink of an eye, right? So like, so there's those rat neurons and they create a grid and they, they encourage the wires to connect in certain ways with the electrochemical stimulation, whatever, like what goes on in the brain. And um, they created nat ne rat neural networks, like a little miniature functioning brain segment or a module, like a module in a, in a transistor radio or something like that. And they train these, um, these rat neural networks to do things like keep a simulated plane balanced during its flight and stuff like that. Um, it's just two little, two little tiny bits of neuroscience. And we've, this is 20, 30, 40 years ago. So we have, we know so much more now. So it, it's reasonable to think that there will come a time a hundred years from now. I think that's, it'll happen before that, but even if it's a thousand years from now, with our knowledge of artificial intelligence, we have really good artificial intelligence in the computer, analyzing human brain activity, like all of those things, and then it'll figure it all out. It'll figure it all out and then we'll be able to replicate it in a computer, a digital version of you or anybody else. Kind of monitor your brain and scan it and get your like minds, your DNA, your mental DNA or your mental algorithms or the you know all the information that's you, and um, upload it or replicate it or sync it with um, something in digital space. So second to the last bullet on the screen, how do you know that you aren't already something like a brain in a vat or a digital mind in the future, in the year 2215 or something like that? How do you know? Right? That's the puzzle that Pollock's little cute little story raises. Here's the, the last bullet on it. And there's a picture, by the way, of a brain in a vat with uh, nutrients connected to it connected to a computer. Um, what experience could you possibly count as evidence or point to, much less as proof, that you're a real being in a flesh and blood body? I mean, you know, I pinch myself and uh, I feel this, you know, ow, right? Um, I mean, you could dream that that happened to you. And also, if they really got all of our neurochemistry right, even digital beings would go, oh, I'm awake because I pinched myself in it. But that's not a proof, right? And in movies, they show little things that might be tricks that you might be able to use to differentiate between when, when you really woke up from a dream or if you're still in a dream that you dreamt that you woke up, but you're still dreaming. And I forget the name. Uh, Inception was the name of that movie. But there's all sorts of philosophical fi-fi movies out there nowadays that try to make some of these ideas real. So the point of the brain in a vat thought experiment is the really in the last question, like if we could get that technology, right? Suppose we already have it. There'd be no way for anyone to be able to prove that they were or were not real. Even if you worked in the lab where you do that stuff to others, pluck brains out of people's heads or a brain cell, you get their DNA, you right, replicate them in the thing, whatever, where you just create simulated beings in a digital space from scratch. Even if you're the technician who does all of that, you yourself could have been created by someone else, like an artificial intelligence program in the future that just runs simulations to see how human beings or human being-like simulations would behave under certain conditions, the conditions that they're the neuroscientists, you know, performing this kind of thing. So, so that, those are some philosophical puzzles that um, I hope have gripped your attention and your curiosity and perplexed you on some level.